Hello, and welcome to our Week 10 Overview Lecture. Uh, we're in our final week of our economics theme. We're continuing some of the discussions we had last week, which are about the role of states in economies and planning and how the economy ought to be organized. But we're zooming forward in time and looking at these topics with reference to more contemporary debates over globalization and also over the recent global financial crisis. So we have three main topics that we'll be taking a look at this week. The first is called neoliberalism, economic rationalism, and the Washington Consensus. These are terms that get thrown around a lot. Their meaning often becomes sort of blurred or smeared. They sort of widen and they swallow up and encompass a lot of things. Our readings this week are about trying to get a more precise sense of the definition of these terms, the history of these terms, and a feel for what they might focus in on in a more narrow sense, and then also how they get used and abused in a broader policy discussion. We're also going to look at defining and debating globalization. We've already talked about this a little bit in previous weeks of the term. The issue of how new the current round of globalization is. How is it different from what might have happened before? There are disagreements about this, and we're going to take a look at some of those disagreements. And then we have a final subtopic on global crises and opportunities, which is going to be looking particularly at anti-globalization movements and responses to those movements, and at the recent global financial crisis and responses to that crisis. Okay, so we'll try to bring ourselves up to the present, including some extremely recent works on trends in the global economy and how we might institutionally respond to those trends. So in our first topic on neoliberalism, economic rationalism, and the Washington Consensus, many of the readings are going to be concerned with working out how we should define these terms. And the reason the readings focus on this is, in fact, the terms are used in newspapers or even in academic journal articles in a very loose way. And they're frequently used as insults. They frequently label positions an author doesn't like. Most of our reading selections are people who are trying to be a little more precise than that, while also giving a sense of the general insult-based character of these terms. So the first option is by Taylor Boas and Jordan Gansmorse, and it's an empirical analysis of the use of the term neoliberalism in scholarly journals over time. So they just count up how it's used, they try to figure out the political perspective of the piece that's using the term, and roughly what meanings come out in these pieces. And they argue that the term is vague and ill-defined recently, and it's adopted overwhelmingly by people who are opposed to market reforms. They note that this is interesting because this current meaning of the term neoliberalism actually inverts an older meaning, which was once adopted to indicate a kind of a moderation of classical liberalism, positions that were not going to be as extreme as it felt classical liberalism might have been. They propose a more precise definition of the term neoliberalism to try to make the word more analytically useful now. These sorts of efforts almost never work. Once a word has become blurred in its definition and used as a general insult, it's very, very hard to claw that back. But we can take a look at, at what they're suggesting. Hadrian Chang is responding more to the literature on the Washington Consensus and on notions that there might be a set of economic policies that are relatively uniform in character that developing countries ought to adopt in order to develop properly. Uh, Chang contrasts what he calls an official history of capitalism, which he thinks is a story that there is a steadied progression toward freer and freer trade, maybe interrupted or delayed at various points, but it's a story, a sort of a background assumption about how currently developed countries got to be developed. Uh, Chang says that this is actually in stark contrast to the actual history in which current developed countries mostly used anti-free trade policies during their period of actual development. And he argues that currently, developed, currently developing countries should be permitted similar protectionist policies based on their own local conditions. Oliver Hardwich is analyzing, again, the very diverse coalition of people that array themselves against neoliberalism. He points out that the people who use the term and who use it as an insult don't generally have a lot in common. He also notes that almost nobody self-identifies as neoliberal. It is almost exclusively what he calls a political swear word. It's something you use to tar and feather somebody else rather than as an analytic category. He also traces the history of the term 
from associations with a liberal mixed economy, in Germany in particular, in the 20th century, uh, toward its current use, where it's used for sort of more extreme market positions and used as a term of insult. David Harvey is a Marxist critic of neoliberal economic policies. This is a piece that uses the term in its more insult-based sense. So if you, get, uh, if you read this article, you'll get a sense of an example of how this operates. He argues that neoliberalism has become what he calls a hegemonic discourse. And hegemony is a concept that a lot of the readings from this week will use. We can unpack that a bit in your classroom discussions and tutorials. But he argues it's a hegemonic, a dominant discourse that he thinks is operated to reassert class privilege, to roll back a post-World War II, more egalitarian, social democratic set of policies, and to channel wealth from poorer to more wealthy classes in the core, and from poorer to more wealthy nations around the globe. And again, these are contested points, but the issue of equality and whether post-World War II there were trends toward equality that are now being rolled back is going to be an interest and a concern of a number of the authors we'll look at this week. There's Moises Naim, who's arguing that Washington policy prescriptions for developing countries act as though they reflect a consensus, a sort of an evidence-based, informed sense of what kinds of policies are necessary to achieve development and growth, um, but argues that these instead should be better understood as sort of fads and constantly moving goalposts that are not consistently applied anywhere. They come and go. They're modified quite rapidly. At the same time, they have quite devastating effects on large parts of the world. So looking at the quick changes that are made to policy in these, this area, such that what gets called the Washington consensus is not as stable and secure and based on strong evidence as it might appear. Uh, Danny Roderick is an author. We've got several possible readings from him uh, across each of the subtopics this week, uh, writing a great deal on globalization, on international economic policy, and on the Washington Consensus. Here he's looking at the Washington Consensus and specifically its failure to achieve its intended aims and competing proposals for what should replace it. Roderick is arguing that the strategies that should be adopted shouldn't be one uniform strategy that's understood to apply to developing countries as such, that instead you need a kind of a pluralism of strategies, that you need to adopt different approaches that are sensitive to different local contexts. Tom Valentine is analyzing the history of the term economic rationalism, which is a term that originates in Australia and is dominant here in a way that neoliberalism might be elsewhere. Uh, he argues that the term encompasses what used to be called economic liberalism, an approach that is advocating for the price system to be as free from state interference as possible because it's understood to be the best means of coordinating most aspects of economic production. But he argues that the term is often used in this insult form uh, to characterize particularly extreme forms of economic liberalism where he will argue that that's not necessarily what the term has to imply. Then we've got two pieces from John Williamson, who's an author associated with articulating and specifying the Washington Consensus. And so we've got a piece from him in which he makes that specification. And then we've got a second piece reflecting on the specification after a period of time in which there have been widespread declarations and publications that the Washington Consensus has failed. His position is that the actual consensus is still largely consensus, but that it came to have a broader meaning, and it's that broader meaning that's come under fire. Topic two, we'll look at defining and debating globalization. What is it? What are its implications? Uh, is it an accurate term to use? And is the current period of globalization something that we can say is meaningfully different from earlier periods? Uh, the first author in this section is Frederick Cooper. 
He's looking at globalization from the perspective of African history, and he argues that this is a particularly good perspective for understanding the limits of the concept. He thinks that it's a concept that implies the existence of a single type of interconnection, and also that implies that global interconnections are historically recent. And he says that African history can cast light on both of these things that can suggest that actually you've got many, many different kinds of interconnection operating at any given time. There are places as well that capital still doesn't penetrate, and there are many different active structures necessary to make connections work, and that you can do, you can analyze these sorts of connections as they unfold over a quite long period of time, so that not as much as new as may seem to be. Jeffrey Frankel is contrasting the current period of globalization with historical forms of globalization, things that we've seen in the past, and also with potential kind of counterfactual future forms of globalization that might have other attributes, maybe even more desirable attributes than our current round of globalization. He's also interested in analyzing barriers to globalization and argues that the current round of globalization can't be seen as something that is inevitable or irreversible, that any time you've got trends to globalization, you've also got counter trends opposing that, and you don't actually know which of those are going to win out in the long run. Um, we've got a fairly straightforward piece by Anthony Giddens, which is actually written for a mass popular audience, so it's quite easy to read. It's trying to schematize debates over globalization for a popular audience and argues that the current round of globalization should be understood as historically new. So where a lot of the authors are trying to talk about things that are continuous or earlier rounds of globalization and how they compare, Giddens think that there is something specifically new and revolutionary in the role of current communications technologies uh, and intellectual technologies in the present round of globalization. Uh, he thinks that this helps to undergird some contradictory impacts of the round. So on the one hand, you have the spread and circulation, for example, of global cultural information uh, around the world. On the other hand, you have tools for encouraging the assertion of particularly local identities. He sees this as a contradictory period with enormous opportunities and risks, and he'll try to unpack some of those in this fairly straightforward piece. Uh, Douglas Irwin is giving a fairly factual presentation of empirical trends in world trade that are associated with the current round of globalization. And he's combining these with an analysis of the concerns that motivate the anti-globalization protest movements. Robert Kiyohane and Joseph Nye are analyzing different aspects of globalization. So what they're reacting to is the idea that globalization is similar to earlier phenomena that used to be described as interdependence, but it layers on to the earlier concept of interdependence some new dimensions, and they're going to try to unpack what they think are multiple dimensions of the process of globalization in order to specify what can be said to be new and what can be said to be qualitatively different from earlier historical periods. Jan Nedervin Peters is arguing that globalization is often understood in terms of homogenization or westernization but that these are not adequate ways to understand it. It also needs to be understood in terms of multiple processes that generate new forms of cultural, social, and economic hybrids. So they're new forms of cooperation, they're contradictory and much more open-ended possibilities for future development. So this piece opposes the idea that globalization is solely homogenizing. It is a creative force and it creates new combinations of things that haven't existed in the past that have open-ended possibilities. Alejandro Portes is analyzing the tensions between what is or normally presented as global and freely moving forms of capital with more local and restricted flows of labor, trying to argue that we need to look beyond the notion of local flows of labor and get a better appreciation for the development of transnational communities in understanding the impact of the current round of globalization on the working classes. Leonard Reed Milton Friedman, this is an older piece and it is a fable. It's a fable of the complexity of modern production. 
and it's aimed at valorizing decentralized forms of decision making that enable people to unintentionally coordinate their actions in order to achieve quite complex results. Uh, I've included this piece because this is a vision of what globalization is and how it works that floats around in certain spaces, visualizing globalization as a vast and sort of horizontal market in which people are making decisions motivated by the price mechanism. So it picks up on some of the things that would have been involved in the Hayek reading from last week. Danny Roderick again criticizing the level of policy debate over globalization and trying to pose some clear questions that he thinks are amenable to empirical analysis that would help resolve some of the important issues on a policy level. And he's particularly interested in tensions that are driving concerns about globalization within the anti-globalization movement. And he looks at questions about national, national sovereignty, particularly in relation to social insurance and the provision of safety nets, and the consequences for domestic workforces when social insurance and safety nets are undermined. Roderick's particularly interested in arguments that globalization means that these kinds of safety net systems are no longer tenable. He thinks they are more tenable than the current policy discussion admits. And then our final option in this section is Emmanuel Wallerstein. He's a very prominent world systems theorist who has a conception of capitalism as a global phenomenon that has gone through several stages in its long history. And he's looking at three particular stages here in which he thinks there is a hegemonic power under which production has been organized. He doesn't think that this is the norm. He doesn't think it tends to stay this way for very long. And so he's interested in looking at these periods where you've had a hegemonic dominant power within the capitalist global economy. He thinks one of these periods ended in the late 60s and we're now off into a new and slightly more unpredictable world. He's interested in analyzing the demise of these earlier periods uh, of hegemonic organization of global capitalism in order to cast light on our current period and give some sense of what might be happening now. And then our final topic here is on global crises and opportunities. And we've got quite a diverse set of authors here casting very, very different lights on things that are happening. Mike Davis is interested in the phenomenon of rapid urbanization of the global population. And he's looking at the implications of the rise of large slum and shantytown populations all over the world in vast megacities very, very rapidly and the associated rise of what he calls an informal proletariat. And he wants to look at the implications of these demographic trends, which he doesn't think are accounted for in many predictions about what would happen with the global economy. He's interested in their implications for theories of development and how we think about poverty and roots out of poverty. Ehrenreich and Hochschild are analyzing the pressures on poor women to migrate for work in domestic and sex trades. They think that this is a neglected dimension of globalization. It is a, an aspect of the global economy that doesn't get as much attention. And they're interested in the impact on the women who have to move, often leaving their own families behind, hoping to make enough of a living that they can support their families from abroad. We have a piece from Jeffrey Frieden and a set of other authors as well, analyzing the implications of the global financial crisis for the existing framework of international cooperation and the global governance of, in of economic institutions. This piece is arguing that our existing framework for global economic governance is looking a little bit shaky in the wake of the global financial crisis and that we need to start thinking about what kinds of institutional innovations we can come up with on an international scale that will make global economic governance more viable. Uh, we have a short and fairly easy to read piece here by Francis Fukuyama, who is revisiting some of his ideas, again, in the wake of the global financial crisis. Uh, at, like the previous pieces of Fukuyama that we've taken a look at, he's interested in the role of ideas in history. And particularly, he's interested in the fact that we haven't seen dramatic new left-wing ideas coming up with some mobilization or comprehensive response to the global financial crisis. He argues that this failure to develop new ideals has left a kind of an open space in which you're getting various forms of right-wing populism. He talks about the Tea Party movements and things like that. 
Um, and he's interested in what it would take to develop new ideals to motivate the current middle classes to move beyond the valorization of the free market and the demonization of the state. Where are the left ideals, he asks in this piece, uh, to counter the right-wing forms of populism that we're seeing. Harold James is an exploration of the fragility of our current round of globalization, looking at previous rounds of globalization and the ways in which they collapsed, uh, using these historical case studies to point out that, again, things are quite shaky and we can't be totally certain that the current round of globalization is going to be anything particularly long-term, anything that's going to sustain itself. I've added a piece from Thomas Piketty uh, into this subtopic. This is a real phenomenon of a text. It was only just translated into English after the initial design of this course, um, but it has attracted so much attention from so many different spaces that I thought it was important to tuck a chapter of it in to let you take a look at it and assess it yourself. Uh, this is something that is causing huge debate within economic and policy circles. It's all over the newspapers. It's a best-selling book. Uh, so it's, it's certainly a current thing that's worth taking a look at. He's looking at the post-World War II trend toward greater equality, which has been highlighted in a number of the readings in this theme. He thinks that this trend is looking like it's going to have been a historical anomaly. He says that if you look at the longer term history, the trend is toward greater and greater and greater inequality, and that we have sort of a false sense of security coming off of the post-World War II period where it looked like that was being reversed. He says that current empirical evidence is pointing toward a movement back to what he thinks is probably a more normal pattern of intense concentration of inherited wealth in the hands of a few. And he's analyzing the implications of that and whether there's a possible or a viable social policy response. He thinks that we do know what we could do about it, but whether there's a political will to do it is another matter entirely. Uh, a piece by Danny Roderick again in this sub-theme, looking at labor movement opposition to globalization and looking at tensions within globalization that provoke that labor movement mobilization. Uh, John Grodrugi is looking at the breakdown of a social compromise that he thinks was necessary for negotiating the survival of liberal economic principles in the 20th century. So he thinks that the key to the survival of some sort of liberal economic uh, principle had been that markets were going to be embedded within some kind of social community, a welfare state, a social insurance scheme, a set of safety net provisions, and that these were understood to offset the negative consequences of markets, and that it was only in the understanding that these consequences would be offset that you secured support for markets when much of the rest of the world had actually rejected them. He argues that this compromise presupposed an international community of national markets under the control of individual states. And the difficulty is that this international community has broken down in the wake of globalization. States no longer have the same kind of control over the domestic economies. And he's looking at anti-globalization movements in the context of these changes. So what provokes these movements and whether states can go back to some sort of compromise. Jeffrey Sachs's piece is pretty much a manifesto. It's asking for a current day kind of enlightenment project that can promote political and economic development on a global scale. It looks at the goals of the anti-globalization movement and endorses those goals in broad principles, but thinks the proposed means are flawed and analyzes the ways in which you can have forms of trade liberalization along with forms of political liberalization that Sachs believes will promote a, a further development process globally. Kenneth Shave and Matthew Slaughter are analyzing an apparent paradox that while globalization appears good in aggregate for developed and developing economies, what we're seeing is rising support for protectionism in both the developed and the developing world. And they wonder why that's the case. Why is it that if you ask people, is globalization good, they'll say yes, but do you want protectionism? Yes, they want that too. 
and they argue that the trend reflects stagnating incomes and skewed income distribution. So there are echoes here of some of the things that Piketty is also pointing out. And they argue that this needs to be addressed by some sort of new redistributive policies. They call it a new deal for globalization. And finally, Joseph Stiglitz, who's analyzing the historical transformations of major institutions associated with globalization, looking particularly at the IMF, the World Bank, and the WTO. He's trying to cast light on failures and limitations of globalization that have been highlighted by the anti-globalization movements, but he's particularly focused on institutional roles in this. So the set of set of Washington-based international regulatory or interventionist bodies uh, and the way in which the decisions within these bodies are made by only a very, very narrow slice of people. He's arguing in favor of a broader enfranchisement, the involvement of greater numbers of voices in the management of these institutions as a way to have better forms of globalization and more buy-in to globalization. Okay, so those are our choices. Wide range of reading this week. Many of them will hit on similar points, will come together in the class discussion and exchange some of the insights from the different authors.